Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. The director of the Anti Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. Welcome back. Good morning, DJ. How are you NV. feeling this morning? You know, I'm glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm here. We've definitely got stuff to talk about. Man, what is going on in the world? For people that don't know, don't understand what is going on in Israel and Gaza, what is happening? Look, it is, uh, these are dark days. These are dark, dark days. I would say that this last week has probably been the toughest week of my adult life. Mm. So last Friday night, around 1.30 in the morning, I got a call from the head of my Israel office who lives in a town called Modin. Mm -hmm. Who said, you know, when the phone rings at 1.30 in the morning, you know, I, I look at the phone. And she said, Jonathan, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of rockets coming into Israel. She said, I don't know exactly what's going on, but you need to know. Something's up. And so then I called my other staff in Israel and was basically up all night trying to figure out what was going on. And then I would say it was around 6 in the morning that we started to get word here what had actually happened. Mm. So it turned out that those rockets that were sent by Hamas into you know, civilian targets in Israel were sort of a cover or a distraction for what was really happening, which was this terrorist infiltration and the massacres that took place up and down the Gaza border in all of these surrounding towns. Mm. Um, and they were brutal. I mean, the stories that are still coming out more than 1,300 civilians, not just killed, although they were. I mean, it was a slaughter. It was a slaughter. Um, but he said the largest, what is the largest number of Jewish people killed in one day since the since Holocaust? Since the Holocaust. Jesus. This is, I think, the largest terrorist <clears throat> act of terrorism since 9-11. Uh, mm. I think it's one of the largest acts of terrorism since the Second World War. And these people weren't just killed. I mean, they were slaughtered. When I say slaughtered, they were raped. They were tortured. Babies were burned in their cribs. Mm. Children were executed in front of their parents. Parents were executed in front of their children. Elderly people were shot in the head at point-blank range. Uh, um, and they didn't just kill Israeli Jews. Israeli Arabs were killed. Asian people who live and work in Israel, there were videos of Thai people being killed. I saw one man, a video of one man being, I mean, he was bloodied, he'd been brutalized, being beheaded with a shovel. Mm. Filipino workers were killed. A lot of people died at this music festival. There was a music festival, a peace festival. And these men came in on like mechanized hand gliders of some sort with automatic weapons and gunned down approximately 260 young people. These are boys and girls and teenagers. Shot them in the back. Some of the people who'd come in on land were dressed as Israeli medics. They were in like uniforms, you know? And they were in the parking lot apparently. They stationed themselves in the parking lot. So these men flew in. And as I understand, the concert goers who filmed it on their phones, because these people were coming in, they thought it was part of the show. It's like a rave. Mm -hmm. <sighs> they shot them, shot at them, and the people ran. And they ran to the parking lot. And there were medics there who they thought came in to help. And then the medics took out their guns, because they were actually these terrorists. And killed them all. <laughs> they burned people alive in their cars. And of course, the people that they didn't kill, that they didn't maim, that they didn't mutilate, they raped a lot of the women before they killed them. Uh, there were stories about women who were shot in the leg so they couldn't run and then raped. Some of them were killed. But a number of them and others were then seized and brought into Gaza. And so we know this because we have the footage. This is the thing. We have the footage of all of this because these people gleefully videoed it on their phones. 
There was a story that I heard about one girl who saw the video of her grandmother being killed because they came into her home. They had the grandmother op- give them her phone, open her phone. They videoed themselves killing the grandmother. Then they uploaded it to the YouTube chats, or sorry, the WhatsApp chats on her phone. So that's how the grandmother saw her grandmother die in the family WhatsApp chat. Well, the grandmother saw her grandmother? The granddaughter. 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 Sorry if I said it wrong. The granddaughter learned that her grandmother had been killed because these men uploaded the video into the gra- into the family WhatsApp chat from the grandmother's phone. Um, but they've seized a lot of these people and they brought them into Gaza. And again, we have the footage of all of this. We have the footage of the murders. We have the footage of the torture. We have the footage of the beheadings. We have a footage of these people in Gaza. Like the, There's a, a number of videos. You may have seen them. There's one video of a young woman battered and bleeding, forced out of a car, mocked by the crowd, and then lit on fire. Mm. Set on fire in front of all of these people. There's a video, another video I've seen of a young girl brought out of a car bleeding from the crotch. I mean, it's bloody. You know, and they're leading her through and they're chanting and whooping and hollering like she's some kind of, I don't know, trophy or something. What? So, I mean, these things, these videos, like I can't get them out of my mind. Like, you know, we talk about what happened in Rwanda. We talk about what happened in Cambodia. We talk about what happened in the Holocaust. And these are like, things over there, right? And I'm not minimizing them at all, but oftentimes these are incidents for which we don't have the live footage. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for us to relate to them. You can see it, it's like when they put the pictures of the Vietnam War on the papers back in the day, you can see it. You can actually see what's going on. And like these are, I mean, it's like live in color on your phone, real time. Mm -hmm. And the, and the, the, again, like the, applauding of it mm. and the 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 ap- apparent you know grotesque macabre fun of it for these people it's just a kind of sadism that i mean look i know people who are killed we i just learned this morning driving in that my son's camp counselor my son goes to a jewish overnight camp mm-hmm. a lot of kids go to camp and they have some israelis who come in and they're the counselors the counselor from his bunk had been missing since all this happened. Meaning people knew he was down there Mm. and couldn't find him. And I learned this morning that they identified his corpse overnight, I guess. So I don't know if he was one of the people who was burned beyond recognition. Mm. I don't know if he was one of the people who was beheaded. And so they didn't have an easy way to know who he was. But they just figured it out, you know, six days later. Let, let me ask you a question. So asking and friends and people tell me that the Israeli military is very strong. Yeah. And they also tell me there's a, a, a lot of military. And they also said that they have this technology that I believe that only the Israeli military in the yeah. United States has where yeah. they can block missiles that come. And it's like yeah. a high percentage rate of them blocking. I think it's called the Iron Iron Dome. The Iron Dome. Yeah. Uh, so what happened to those strategies? Were none of that into play? Well, or? I think, I don't know exactly, but here's what I think, MV. I think what happened was, look, this was, first of all, we think about Hamas, and I think clearly there were a lot of failures here. Mm-hmm. There were intelligence failures, a military failure, a technology failure, and a, and a moral failure, and I'll talk about that mm-hmm. in a bit. But just on the military failure, technology failure. I think that, look, the Hamas is not some random group of guys, you know, showing up on Saturdays and doing like, you know, cosplay. It's a highly trained military force that's been groomed over decades by the Iranians. Armed, trained, all of that. And so I think what they did was they identified the Israeli like technology centers, like the antenna and the different posts where they had the means by which they could surveil or detect, and they took them out. And I think that inhibited the Israeli response. I also think that the Israelis did not believe they had the capability of launching missiles like that. But what we now know, why? Because they've, they filmed it, 
that Hamas was, you know, there's been a big water crisis in Gaza for years. Just step back. Like Gaza is a is an impoverished, very tough place. Like our hearts should break for the people of Gaza, right? Mm-hmm. Who live under a repressive Hamas regime, who have suffered greatly. Like we should there's a there's a there's a human dimension to this on that side that we you can't talk about this without talking about that. Mm-hmm. Whose fault is that? Well, it's Hamas's fault, 100%. Now, I'll okay. give you a good example of it. So the Israelis didn't think that they had the technology, and there's also been this water crisis for years, a lack of potable water, a lack of drinking water, s- terrible sewage problem. So it turns out, and now we know this because they filmed it, that Hamas has been taking the water pipes out of the ground, repurposing them in, in makeshift factories into missiles. So where did Hamas get thousands of missiles? They didn't, the Israelis would never prevent, you know, missile parts from going in, neither would the Egyptians. Where did they come from? They took the water pipes out of the ground, the water pipes that serve their population, that facilitate things like sewage and the passage of potable water, and they turned them into missiles. And again, you can see the footage of this. So we say, whose fault is it? Like, it is reasonable to say that um, it would be, I mean, Gaza does not need to be like this. Mm-hmm. It does not need to be the most densely placed, the most, I don't know if this is exactly the most densely, but a highly densely, highly impoverished pocket. Um, but the reason why it is that, the reason why it is in such bad straits is because of the Hamas that runs it, the, that took over in a coup d'etat in 2005, or maybe 2007. The Hamas that has not had an election in 16 years. The Hamas that forces women to wear hijabs. The Hamas that hangs gay people or kills them. You know, there are no gay people in Gaza, or at least open or out. The Hamas that doesn't allow the construction of churches or, you know, other kind of wor- means of worship for other people. I mean, that's the reason why the situation is where it is. I'm not saying Israel is not, doesn't have its problems. I'm not saying Israel shouldn't do more. I mean, you know, I've been here before and I've been an active, active, fierce, ferocious advocate for a two-state solution for years. And I've gotten a lot of criticism from some in my community, but I've always believed, I still believe as we sit here today, that you will never have a true and sustainable peace unless you have safety and security for Israelis and dignity and equality for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. I don't think you can ever build walls that are high enough. Mm-hmm. I don't. However, like the the war that is now being fought wasn't started by the Israelis, you know. And the way I would describe it is, you know, the IDF, the Israeli Army. They are there. They use the army to protect their citizens. Hamas uses their citizens to protect themselves. They were saying they put that- missile launchers in hospitals. I was that, yeah. They put missile launchers in schools. They put guns and arms in mosques. They dig holes like for the tunnels inside people's homes. So why do they do that? They do that because the Israelis abide by the conventions of the the Geneva Convention and the rules of war. And you are not supposed to, you are not supposed to bomb hospitals or schools or mosques. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if you're launching missiles from it, it's a different story and you're then implicating it. But that's the idea, and that's why they do it. So they don't leave the Israelis with much choice. And uh, using their own people as human shields, taking Israelis, hundreds of people as hostages, taking elderly people and children. I can show, I will show you the videos. I think that's the saddest part, you know, looking at civilians in Israel, civilians in Palestine, dying and being casualties of something that seems like it's way bigger than them. Yeah, I mean, I think this will be called the Hamas War. Mm. I think that's what what this will be referred to as we look back on it. Um, because again, it is it is tragic when civilians are killed. Uh, but the ones who killed the Israelis, again, the grandchildren and the disabled people, ugh, were the Hamas terrorists, and the people who are now killing the Gazans are Hamas terrorists. Because if the Hamas terrorists put these hostages out, if they just gave them back, the Israelis would have no pretext to do, it would be very difficult for the Israelis to do what they're doing. I mean, Israel is retaliating, though. 
I would say they're responding in a defensive measure. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that, and I use that framing because, again, this wouldn't have happened had they not gone in and butchered all these people. It just wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is where, you know, Envy, you asked appropriately, like, don't they have the Iron Dome? And don't they have all this intelligence? And they do. And so I think there will be like forensics and after actions to try to understand how did this happen mm. for years. Mm. But it's not just a military failure. It's not just an intelligence failure. It's a moral failure. Because Hamas in its charter, which was written in 1987, it says its goal is not a two-state solution. It's to eradicate the Zionist entity. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. I actually brought it with me, you know, so I would have it so I could read it in, it says, Israel will exist and continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it. Mm. So if you read the charter, right, I mean, it's off the wall, but I think the Israelis came to believe that they could find like a, a, like a modus vivendi, like they could find some kind of status quo and live with them. Yes, they hate us, but they'll stay there and we'll stay here. And I think that was wrong. And I'll also tell you that I think all of us, like me and American policymakers and others who figured, you know what? How bad could it be? They'll stay on their side. They'll learn to work it out. We were wrong. And when people tell you they want to kill you, you need to believe them. Mm -hmm. And when people tell you you're not a human being, you're a Zionist, and you are committing genocide, and you don't deserve to live, like, we should know already. Like, listen to your enemies. Take them seriously. And I don't think we took it seriously enough. Do you think this is start another world war? I don't know. I think America sent that big aircraft carrier over there as a warning to the Iranians. Look, again, Hamas is funded by Iran. Mm -hmm. The Hamas government, they don't, do, they don't trade with other countries. They don't build industry. 70% of their budget comes from Iran. So again, this is, so how does it happen mm -hmm. that they are at war with their own people, impoverishing them, at their war with Israel? It's because they don't have any accountability. So America, and so they're a proxy, they're a militia. They're like an extension of the Iranian Re Revolutionary Guard, their army. Okay, so if Israel goes into Gaza, as they will, is that going to prompt other countries to get involved? I think America moved its aircraft carrier over there mm -hmm. as a sign to the Iranians, don't get involved. Um, so I hope that that will deter the Iranians from doing anything. I mean, we've seen in the weeks since this happened, all the governments in Europe, almost all the governments in the world, I think, have spoken out in support of Israel and condemned the massacre. But- um, They say Putin wants to take advantage of the- Sure, he does. War. Like even a Hamas official even revealed the intent behind the assault on Russian television. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I saw that on CNN yesterday. Look, it plays into Russia's hands. They want to distract the world from the savagery they're doing in Ukraine. Like I get it. Mm -hmm. They want the West to fund divert money to Israel, and not to Ukraine. I get it. They want the UN to be focused on Israel, not Ukraine. I get it. Like it works for Russia. But look, if God forbid there's a world war, I mean, God forbid Iran gets involved and they shut down the Gulf and then oil can't move and then prices go up and like the whole thing could spiral really quickly, really quickly. What, what is the difference between Palestine, civilians in Palestine who, who might feel like, who feel they're being oppressed by an Israeli government? What's the difference between them and Hamas? It's a super good question. So, so let's step back, right? So basically in that part of the world where there have been indigenous Jews and indigenous Muslims living forever, for a long time, thousands of years, um, 1948, the United Nations, these people are skirmishing and fighting with each other. I want land, I want land. The British pull out. The United Nations says we're going to partition the land, one side for the Jews, one side for the Arabs. Now one thing I'll just note here, the Jews. So Jews are both a religion and an ethnicity, right? Jews are from the ancient tribes of Judea, right? You read it in the Bible. That's who the Jews are. Now you can certainly convert to Judaism and not be of that ethnic stock, but it's a little confusing because we are both an ethnicity and we are a religion. 
Um, okay, so that being said, so the Jews in the area and the Arabs in the area, the Jews say, the Jews want all the land, the Arabs want all the land. They partition it. The Jews say, okay, we'll take half. The Arabs say, we won't, we want it all. And so they go to war. They go to war against this, this little state, and that's Jordan and Egypt and Syria and Lebanon um, and Iraq, I think. And the Israelis, this new little country, 1948, they survive. And so that becomes Israel. Then in 1967, Syria and Egypt and Jordan go to war again against Israel. They attack Israel and Israel wins. And when it wins, it pushes back on Jordan, which had a bunch of the land that the Arabs didn't want or the Palestinian Arabs didn't accept. Mm -hmm. And so that they occupy that. And that is called um, the West Bank. And then the Israelis also occupy part of the land the Egyptians came up from, and that's called Gaza. Okay, and the the Israelis also occupy part of the land that Syria came in and attacked them from, and that's called the Golan Heights. So now Israel, which was once this big, gets bigger, and they also occupy the Sinai that um, the Sinai area that Egypt also came in from. Okay, 1973, the Arabs attack again. Israel repels them again, but they have all this land. 1978, uh, Israel makes peace with Egypt, and they give them back the Sinai. Uh, 1993, the Oslo Accords, the idea is Israel's going to make peace with the Palestinian Authority, which is, so let's sit back, 1962, remember, uh, as I explained, there's a partition, Israel, the Jews take half the land, the Arabs refuse, the Jews survive, the land that was going to go to the Arabs, Jordan takes it, and Egypt takes it. So in 1967, Israel repels Jordan and occupies that land. That land we call the West Bank. So in 1962, in parallel to this, the PLO is formed to represent the Palestinian people, the indigenous people who got, you know, who the Arabs who didn't accept the deal in the first place. In 1993, the Oslo Accords, Israel makes peace with the Palestinian, the PLO, and they become the Palestinian Authority, the government in the West Bank. It's just, okay, you can have it. We'll work it out. And in Gaza too, and in Gaza too. And then in 2007, there are elections in Gaza. Hamas wins the elections in Gaza. We'll talk about Hamas in one sec. And uh, the Palestinian Authority doesn't accept it. They fight and Hamas stages a coup d'etat and basically wins. They won in the election. The PA didn't accept it. So they killed, they killed the Palestinian Authority and they took over. That's in Gaza. Now, Hamas, Hamas is in a, it's called the Muslim Brotherhood. It's an Islamic movement. It's got branches in different places, started in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood chapter, if you will, in Gaza is called Hamas. Um, Hamas is formed in 1987. Hamas, like I said, wins the election in 2007. When they don't get power, they kill the Palestinian, they fight and they kill the Palestinian Authority and they take over. So it is and has been, is recognized by the United States and the European Union and many governments as a terrorist organization. Well, it's a government, why? Because as they say in their charter, it's called the Covenant of Hamas, they uh, believe in violence and they don't believe in peace. This is literally what it says. Um, again, I can read it if you want. So they believe in the eradication of the Zionist entity. They don't refer to it as Israel, typically, they call it the Zionist entity because they don't want to recognize that Israel exists. So this terrorist group took over and this terrorist group governs Gaza. This terrorist group, again, um, is a Muslim Brotherhood outfit. So they are a fairly oppressive regime, meaning that it's an Islamic state, meaning they don't allow other religions, they don't allow music, they don't allow dancing. It's a lot like the regime in Iran or what ISIS wanted to build in uh, Syria. So. Um, these are not people who are like liberal Democrats, and these are not people who I think all of us could very easily relate to, or and they would certainly have no interest in relating to, to me. Um, so the ordinary Palestinian people, Charlemagne, are just living there. They are not necessarily members of Hamas. Most Palestinian people are not in the Hamas like military units. They're just moms and dads going to the grocery store. Who probably want a two-state government. I don't know what the polling says about what they want, mm -hmm. but I think they probably just want to raise their kids and take a vacation. Like 
most of us. Um, nonetheless, I will say that Hamas and the Iranians, so a lot of this is being pushed by Iran. We can talk about that. But Hamas, again, has brainwashed and tries to use propaganda to tell their people that they're at war with the Jews. Not with Israel, by the way, with the Jews. So here's where it gets a little confusing. So Israel is a, the Jewish state. It is a Jewish state. It was founded by Jewish people as a homeland for the Jewish people in the ancient land where the Jewish people have always lived. Not all of us. Again, we were thrown out and we've lived all over. Now, there are Jews who don't live in the Jewish state, like uh, me and millions of other people. Nonetheless, it's a Jewish state. So when Hamas says that we want to kill the Zionists, and when Hamas says it's the obligation, it's the, it says, again, I'm reading from their charter, Article 7, the day of judgment will not come until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry out, O oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Mm. So um, as I read this, uh, this is not about, again, Palestinian identity. This mm. is not about dignity and equality of ordinary people. This is about killing Jews, which is why uh, the, pal- the head of, the, of Hamas, who, by the way, lives in Qatar. He doesn't live in Gaza. He doesn't live in the West Bank. He lives in Qatar in a villa. That's where most of their leaders actually live. They don't live in Gaza, even though Hamas controls it, because they're afraid the Israelis will get them. Mm-hmm. So they live in they very, live very posh lives, driving Mercedes Benzes in very nice digs in Doha. But he did a video earlier in the week, and he called for a day of jihad today, a day yeah. of jihad, and said that, again, Muslims should go and kill Jews wherever they are which is why in New York today, Mm -hmm. there is a police presence in front of every synagogue and every school. Because what the Hamas charter tells us, what the Hamas leadership tells us, is that all the Jews are targets. And um, I, I mean, that's just the reality. So Israelis do not say that all Palestinians are targets. Jewish people, they're not my synagogue talking about Muslims. Not only do I talk about that, like if you remember, like. I, this organization, the one that I run, ADL, fights Islamophobia. I have criticized the Israeli government for its policies toward Palestinians. I stood up in 2016 in uh, November after the election when Donald Trump, not my cup of tea, uh, did this. You know, he was talking about uh, registering Muslims. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm. And I stood up in front of a crowd of people and said, um, you know, I'm the grandson of a Holocaust survivor. Like my grandfather lost everything all of his family was slaughtered and exterminated and i said you know as a proud jew if there is a if you try to register muslims i'll be the first person to register myself as a muslim Mm. because i think i think it was an atrocious idea and i will fight anti-muslim bias with every fiber in my being but there aren't Jewish people saying, kill all the Muslims. And there certainly isn't it. The Jewish government, if you want to call it that, in Israel is certainly not saying, kill all Palestinians. And no one is saying that the appropriate response to what happened is to go to a Palestinian music concert and gun down their children and burn them in their cars. So the, the, the level of savagery here is just off the charts. The idea that somehow my, our synagogue on in here in New York is a legitimate military target? Like, do I need to say how insane that is? But if they are, if they're considered a terrorist group, correct, yeah. as what you said, when the, when the world sees a terrorist group, we usually go and try to find or get that terrorist group. Right. How come that hasn't been the same for this case, or has it been? It's a really good question, NP. So yeah, Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization designated by the U.S. State Department and other governments. And yet, I would say that the Israelis don't assassinate, kidnap, arrest Hamas figures around the world. They don't do that. Maybe they should. They don't. Um, Because they usually do that for other, quote-unquote, terrorist groups. The United States has, the United Kingdom has, for sure. The Israelis don't do that. Maybe they should. I mean... 
yeah, the Israeli, I mean, the Hamas, like, you know, that wall, the terrible wall that's built in much of the West Bank, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. The Israelis built it after Hamas did a wave of suicide bombings, if you remember this. They had people strap themselves with explosives and go into cafes and dance clubs and go on public buses, and thousands of Israelis were killed in the 90s, and that's why they did that. Um, sorry, it was the early 2000s, not the 90s. Uh, it, but, you know, no, actually, I'm wrong. It was the mid-90s, and it was, it was in response to the Oslo Accords. It was in response to the push for a two-state solution. Hamas doesn't want a two-state solution. They don't. They say it. They have demonstrated it. And again, when you, when you butcher children, like when you behead babies, clearly you have reached a point where you do not think the other side are people. Mm-hmm. When, I mean, you do not think that Israelis, whatever, whether they call us Israelis or Zionists or Jews, it's all the same. You don't think they're people. You think they're animals. You think they're less than animals. We don't burn animals alive. We don't behead animals. We don't rape animals. We don't do that. And I think cl- you can clearly see through their actions that they regard these, they regard Jews as subhuman. And, you know, I think it's also hard for us, and it's probably hard for your audience. Mm-hmm. Like, look, it's the year 2023. Yeah, why is this still happening? Yeah. We got electric cars, artificial intelligence. We've cracked the genome code. Mm-hmm. We're trying to address climate change. I mean, you don't think, you don't expect that there are people out there who are so brainwashed and are so suffused with hate. But, you know, I wrote this book. I was on your show talking about my book, It Could Happen Here. And the point of the book, It Could Happen Here, was what happens when hate goes to the unthinkable and how can we stop it? Mm -hmm. Like, And the whole point of the book was when you use this hateful rhetoric, when you demonize people, when you dehumanize them, it creates the conditions in which genocide can happen. And so it's why we got to stop it, why we speak out against hate when we see it. Anti-Semitism, anti-black racism, anti-Hispanic you know Hispanic xenophobia, you speak out against it. Because if you don't speak out against hateful comments, it can, you know, a sort of like, uh, what would you call it, like evolve or can move up the chain from comments to actions to systemic systemic policies to violence to genocide. And when I wrote that two years ago, it was certainly based on things like the Holocaust. It was based on things like Rwanda. Mm -hmm. It was based on what I thought the world had learned. And yet here we are, you know, literally sifting through the rubble and counting the bodies, trying to identify the victims in a way which suggests we haven't learned the lessons at all. How would you, what would you say to people who say that? Because uh, you said you've criticized Israel's government before. Sure have. And uh, MSNBC, I saw something yesterday that said Israel's far right government fueled tensions with Hamas. So what what would you say to look about that? Hamas wrote their charter in 1987. Mm-hmm. 1987. Um, last year, uh, the Israeli government was a coalition. You know, it's a coalition government. They had Jews and Muslims in the government. They hadn't they. They had gay and straight and conservative and liberal. This government is certainly more conservative, more right-wing than that one. But the fact of the matter is Hamas didn't change their charter when there were, you know, Palestinian Arabs in the Israeli government. So I don't think it matters who's in the Israeli government. Bibi Netanyahu and the government. I mean, think about it. To Hamas? I don't think so. Yeah, I I can see that. Because Hamas is going to do what they do regardless. Hamas is going to do what they do regardless. Gotcha. Hamas's charter hasn't changed. So it's certainly true that, like, I have been someone who's been pushing the Israeli government for years to, to negotiate with the Palestinian Authority, to try to find ways, try to explore, try to use their kind of political and moral imagination to find ways to bridge gaps. Because, again, I meant what I said before about two-state solution, but when... <laughs> But when the uh, when I see no public demonstrations in the Arab capitals, when I see no words from the Palestinian leadership, when I see them in fact celebrating and hooting and hollering and giving out candies, it feels like they don't want a two-state solution. They want a final solution. And the final solution is the term that Hitler used to describe what he wanted for Europe, which was to exterminate all the Jews. And what we saw happen this weekend in Israel was an extermination of the Jews. 
And so for Jewish people like me, who live just two generations from genocide, this, is, this isn't you know, a book, this isn't some abstraction, this is reality. Is, is it true when they say that uh, the far right government in Israel has escalated military occupations over Palestinians in the name of Jewish supremacy? Uh, look, so a couple things. First, there's Gaza in the West Bank. So let's let's break it down what the difference is. So first you have the West Bank. The West Bank is the area that's controlled by the Palestinian Authority. There is a strong as a military presence there still in parts of it. There's area there are different areas, there are designated areas A, B, and C. There are parts of the West Bank that Israel doesn't go in at all. There are parts that are totally controlled by the PA. There are parts that are controlled by the Israelis. And it's true that the Netanyahu government has allowed for the building of settlements in parts of those area that are infuriating to Palestinians because they can't build the same way. And again, hopefully when there is a two-state solution or there is some modicum of peace, like that area is going to be controlled by the Palestinians so they can live with dignity and equality. So there's no question that Policies of the current government in Israel have done nothing to strengthen the opportunity for peace in that part of the land. Mm -hmm. Then there's Gaza, Gaza that Hamas controls. Gaza, the Israelis withdrew from in 2007. The Israelis used to have settlements there. There used to be IDF presence there. They're gone. Like when I say they're gone, there isn't a single Israeli in that strip of land. Not one. Zero. That's part of why there was this intelligence failure, because no Israelis there. The Israelis do control the borders into Gaza, as does Egypt. So Gaza is bordered by Israel and Egypt. Mm -hmm. So now it's true, again, the Israelis uh, control the flow of things into Gaza, like cement and supplies. Why do they do that? Because they're afraid that the Hamas will use cement and supplies to build arms. Turns out that's true, Mm -hmm. but they control that. So do the Egyptians. Again, it's not just the Israelis, it's the Egyptians too. But this far-right government, uh, the BB government, has continued to supply electricity, to allow supplies to flow, and they have allowed for permits for Palestinian workers to come into Israel. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but Palestinian workers come into Israel from Gaza every single day, thousands of them. And they do this in order to allow these people to make money and have a decent living. Oh, they all say that they say the BB government, you know, they, they they do home demolitions and violent expulsions of people and mass killings and military raids on refugee camps. Like, and I and I don't, I, don't, I hear people trying to use that as a justification for what happened, which I think is there, insane. Yeah, you can't. So I, there is no justification for raping women, oh, I agree. butchering I agree. children. Period. I agree. So what happens in the West Bank? They do do home demolitions of a home where it, someone who goes in and commits a terrorist act. They do that. They do that. They don't do mass killings. That's just not true. That isn't true at all. Now, they may go into arrest and kill someone who is a terrorist who's committed an act against Israeli civilians. They do do that for sure. But these things aren't true. And they don't do anything in Gaza. Um, So it's hard to... It feels like victim blaming. Mm -hmm. It feels like saying, you know, oh, it's the Jews. I mean, I'm seeing this. People saying it's Israel's fault that their people were murdered. It's Israel's fault that their children were kidnapped. And I just think victim blaming is disgusting. It's despicable, especially while we're still burying the bodies. And especially with that history lesson about Hamas. Like, just read it. Right. <laughs> yeah, you said- <laughs> like, it's right here. Yeah. They're not hiding it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, good for them. Good for them for not hiding it. Good for them for making sure we all understand. But bad on us for not taking it more seriously. You think the U.S. is doing enough? No. What do you think that? I mean, I will say, I think President Biden's words were strong Mm -hmm. and they were meaningful and they were important. Um, And I think that the other European countries have been good. And I think, by the way, like in Congress, you know, I think I'm not always a fan of some of these politicians, but I think both on the right and the left, they've gotten it right. Bernie Bernie Sanders said he thinks Israel sees on Gaza as a serious violation of international law. Well, look, I would say to Bernie, as soon as the, I mean, I don't know what Bernie said in response to the savagery that happened. I don't know. I'm sure he, I haven't, I, I'm sure I he, would think he criticized it. Yeah, I would sure hope so. Yeah. But I think there's a way to end this. What did he call it? This, he, uh, he said it's a serious violation of internet. Israel sees on siege. Gaza. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think 
Number one, Bernie Sanders should use, every time he talks about Israel, he should talk about Egypt, because Egypt barricades, blockades that place too. By the way, why does Egypt do it? Because they don't want Hamas terrorists in Egypt either. But number two, Bernie Sanders should, instead of criticizing, he should propose, how do we end the siege in Gaza? Give all the hostages, let all the hostages out. Hamas announced they're ready for peace negotiations with Israel and ready to accept its existence. That would end this like that. Mm -hmm. But if they're not willing to do that, I don't know what he thinks the Israelis should do. Does he think that the Israelis... So if he doesn't think the Israelis should cut off the supplies, what does he think they should do? Mm -hmm. Does he think they should go find a Palestinian concert and rape their children? Does he think that the Israelis should... The Palestinian terrorists... I shouldn't say Palestinian. The Hamas terrorists... The Hamas terrorists went into these towns and went house to house and murdered entire families. We have the videos. So you think, you said the yeah. Should should the Israelis go house to house in Gaza and murder entire families? Of course not. Should the Israelis go in, find some Israeli, good luck finding a music concert in Gaza since they don't allow it. But should the Israelis go murder teenagers? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Like it's, so... What the Israelis need to do is to create pressure to get Hamas to release the hostages and to realize they have to live with their Jewish neighbors. That's they, it. So you said the U.S. should do more. What, what so would, what could the U.S. What do? What could the U.S. do? That's so I would like right help. now to make sure if Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization, like you were asking, Envy, like there should we shouldn't allow people to provide supplies or support for Hamas. We should give. We should pressure Qatar, where these people are living, all the leadership to extradite those people to Israel so they can stand trial for their crimes. Mm. We have a big military base in Qatar. They're quote unquote an ally. There are also Hamas leadership in Turkey. We should pressure our allies in Turkey to have those people stand trial. We should make sure that there's not a single cent from anywhere and that goes to Hamas coffers. And finally, Iran. We need to be a lot tougher on Iran because mm-hmm. Iran, if you cut off Iran and you cut off the flow of money, it would force Hamas to realize they have to work with their neighbors, you know, and can't try to mutilate and murder them. So I think I'd like to see our country do more to quell the flow of money and arms and ideas from Iran to Hamas. Gotcha. I just got a couple more questions. You know, they, they've been putting this thing out on social media where it says 6,400 Palestinians <clears throat> And 300 uh, Israelis have been killed, not counting the recent fatalities, have been killed since 2008. Who's responsible for that? Is that Hamas? Is that the Israeli government? Like, who's responsible for that? Well, look, it's hard for me to talk in the abstract, Mm -hmm. but, like, this isn't a game. This isn't like, oh, we're scoring points here, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't think we can think about this as if it's something we're watching on ESPN. Well, who scored more points? That's real. I mean... That just isn't a construct that applies here. It's not about the number of people who have been killed. Although, just so we're clear, the death of any innocent person is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Like, the death of any innocent person, any child, a child in Gaza, a child in, you know, um, Staro. I mean, these are tragedies. But there is something qualitatively and just, like, obviously different than, uh, again, a terrorist with a machine gun shooting at families, right? And, uh, again, the the grandmother who was burned alive in her house because she was too weak to leave. They burned her alive in her house because she was too difficult to kidnap. And they filmed it. So, like, again, I don't think it's about scoring points, I think it's about recognizing the dignity of every human life and approaching it on that basis. How do you feel I'm, about I'm glad, some... I'm, I'm glad you said that because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sitting there trying to figure out why do you think, whether you're pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, why do you think people try to justify these attacks and people losing their lives? <clears throat> well, look, we should talk about that because there have been rallies here in the U.S. that are pro-Hamas. Like the black, the BLM chapter in Chicago and in LA, did you see? Yeah, I saw that mm-hmm. with the paras- was it the parachutes or the hang yeah. or something coming Like in? glorifying these people and mm-hmm. saying all these things that, oh, the resistance and the this and decolonization. If you think decolonization requires you to like sodomize the elderly, like there's a special place in hell for you. Mm-hmm. 
So I like, and I'm someone who stood up and said Black Lives Matter. I said it on your show. Like I believe in these, I think, like why are we even talking about these are basic principles that like, of course all lives are created equal. Of course there is systemic discrimination against black Americans. And if you don't understand that, you're not looking at the data and you're like divorced from reality. But pushing for equality and justice for black people, pushing for, you know, reform of a criminal, of a, like an incarceration industrial complex, pushing for, you know, the ability of every American to have access to vote however they want has nothing to do, no relationship whatsoever to, again, the savagery that we saw in Israel. And the people who conflate the two, who say, well, this is what decolonization looks like. Like, again, I'm sorry, but the level of moral degeneracy there is off the fucking charts. Mm -hmm. Excuse my language. And and so that's like I'm it's having okay a big to curse at a time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's okay, okay to curse, curse at a time, time like this. Okay. <laughs> so I'm having a big problem with this. Maybe you guys can help me. Like I can't, I can't stand up there and say I support Black Lives Matter when they support the genocide of Jews. Like, how do you guys deal with this? Well, I would tell you that was one <clears throat> chapter. Black Lives Matter Chicago. I it doesn't think, speak I, for every I black person. Don't think that, of uh, course not. Of correct. course not. And of course I, I don't, not. I don't know if the whole. I don't know if Black Lives Matter National has spoken out against that yet. I haven't. I, I don't know yet. But I, I definitely don't. I think that's just one chapter. You got to look it up, mm -hmm. because like the movement for Black Lives, which I think is the kind of umbrella group, has also talked about. Uh, actually, can you send that to me, Dan? What did the movement for Black Lives say? Can you pull it up? Do you know? And Jonathan has to leave soon. Oh yeah. Oh. Absolutely. I, I just got a, a question too. Uh, you know. On social media, I don't know yeah. if you're, you're on social media as much, but you see uh, some of the big conversations with celebrities not mentioning it. And I wanted to know what your, your thought about it when they mention Drake or they mention DJ Khaled, who's Khaled is Palestinian and Drake is Jewish, Jewish as yeah. well. So when, when you see celebrities I not talking know. about it, how, how do you feel about it? I feel sad. I feel alone. Like celebrities didn't hesitate to say Black Lives Matter and they should, like just so we're clear after the death of George Floyd. Of course they should. And, you know, celebrities ran to talk about and influencers and people like, I don't know exactly what Drake or DJ Khaled said. They didn't, no, they didn't say anything. People were saying they But they would, never do, though. But they would love Yeah, so like, yeah, I don't, I don't do. want to pick on them in particular. Just celebrities in total because their yeah, names like, came up recently. It's hard. I mean, as a total. Jewish person, when you see, when you, look, I've stood for Black Lives Matter. I fought, you know, I, I fought to stop Asian hate. We launched the Asian American Foundation, for goodness sakes. I'm, I, I, you know, I uh, co-chaired the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington with Reverend Al a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I have proudly stood and will continue to with the NAA and the Urban League and, and LDF and all these groups. These are my friends and their cause is just and I'm not going to stop. But like the movement for black lives, the talk that justifies the genocide of Jews, that says Zionism is racism. Anti-Zionism isn't just anti-Semitism. I used to say that. I used to say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism because dehumanizing Jews right? Or saying, I love the Jewish people. It's just a Jewish state that's illegitimate and needs to be destroyed. So I've said for years, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. But anti-Zionism is actually genocide. It's an argument to savagely rape and mutilate and murder people. Yeah, I'm not and with I, that. I, yeah. Like, who can be? So I don't understand. I truly don't understand how you can say you're an anti-racist and an anti-Zionist in the same breath. Anti-Zionism is anti-humanism. And just so we're clear, Zionism is the idea that the Jewish people should have the right to self-determination in that piece of land. It does not exclude Palestinians in that. It doesn't say anything like the Hamas Charter. That's all, And that's how you get Arab Israelis and Israeli Muslims and Israeli Christians in the government, serving in the IDF. And that's how you get Ethiopian Israelis and Yemeni Israelis and people from all ethnicities and walks of life in the country treated as equals. Now, is there discrimination in Israel? Sure there is. Absolutely. And could Israel, does Israel have to work to make itself more perfect so that all people, regardless of their religion or their ethnic origin, are treated exactly the same? Of course. And yet it's the only democracy in the region. It's the only place where LGBTQ people feel safe. It's the only place where you can have these sort of interfaith families. Look, and while there are, there have been, and will continue to be, you know, Palestinian Muslims in the Israeli government, you think there are any Jewish people in the Iranian government? 
I mean, again, they're not democracies with coalitions. Let's just acknowledge it. But do you think there's any like a Jewish minister in the Algerian government? And I'm not saying that to make fun. I mean, there's a thousand year history of Jews in Algeria. There's a, I think, 3,000 year history of Jews in Iran. But the, the, the rights that people are afforded in Israel is just qualitatively different. That's because Zionism is not an ethno-nationalist exclusive idea, but anti-Zionism that justifies, again, shooting teenagers in the back while they flee. I mean, that is barbaric. That is sadistic. And it's just plain wrong. All right. Well, yeah. There you have it. The director of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. Thank you for thank joining you for us. Coming, brother. Can I just say one other thing? Of course. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to talk about this. And it's hard. Like, you're Jewish. Like, this is the week when you should be reaching out to your Jewish friends, your Jewish colleagues. Like, all of us have family in Israel. All of us have friends in Israel. All of us have people over there. And even if you have someone you know, who doesn't say, well, I don't know anyone in Israel, if you're Jewish, you're a target today on the global day of jihad. So I would say this to everybody watching or listening, like this is a time to like reach out to people and say, hey, we got your back. We're there for you. Because like I can tell you, this Jew, I'm not going to stop speaking out for the rights of my black brothers and sisters. I'm not going to stop speaking out against anti-black racism. I'm not going to stop speaking out against other forms of hate. So you guys and the, your audience being there for your Jewish brothers and sisters, you guys being there and speaking out against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, like this is the day, this is the moment to do it because this is when it really matters. All right. Absolutely. It's Jonathan Greenblatt. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you, guys. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.